So moving right along, uh, what we're going to talk about today, just an overview of uh, today's presentation. Uh, first of all, we'll always do an overview of asset protection and you know, what you shouldn't uh, and should do and when uh, in regards to uh, protecting your assets. Uh, we'll then focus a little bit on captive uh, insurance uh, and the captive insurance company, also referred to as the captive. So we'll define that. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, whether you should be establishing your captive uh, domestically uh, or internationally. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the different jurisdictions for your captive and how to choose one that fits your needs, uh, and also go into uh, the risks that uh, the captive can insure. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about corporate formalities to follow after establishing your captive, and also how to distribute and benefit from the profits uh, that your captive makes over time. Uh, we'll also touch briefly on how you can use business succession planning uh, and estate planning to maximize your asset protection plan. Um, again, today is going to be just a brief overview. You know, we'll spend 20, 30, 40 minutes, uh, however long it takes, and certainly if you have any more. Uh, detailed questions, you know, feel free to uh, call our office and uh, happy to uh, have a complimentary preliminary consultation with you. So a little bit of background information. You know, first of all, what is asset protection? And you know, people give a lot of different definitions of asset protection. And to me, the definition that I give is that asset protection is the legal process of titling both your personal and the business assets to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors. And I'm going to repeat that because it's a long definition. Uh, my definition of asset protection is the legal process of titling both your personal and business assets to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors while simultaneously still enjoying the benefit of those assets. So what we do as asset protection attorneys is we help our clients protect any asset they have from any financial threats. You know, our clients might be doctors, business owners, professional athletes, people who received money in an inheritance or a divorce, lawyers, CPAs, financial advisors, really anybody. And the type of assets that we help them protect might be as simple as you know, liquid assets like checking, savings, stocks, bonds, CDs, money markets. Might be uh, real estate like primary residences, rental real estate, vacation homes, investment properties, cars, boats, planes. Might be the business itself like shares in a corporation, membership interest in an LLC, even intellectual property like phone numbers and domain names. So really anything of value. And we're helping protect that against any financial threat. So in today's day and age, you know, mostly lawsuits, creditors, short sale foreclosure deficiencies, judgments, divorce, you know, anything that can take away what you worked your whole life to obtain. And a lot of people say, well, you know, when do I need asset protection? Do I have enough assets to protect? And, you know, the short answer is yes. You know, the less you have, the more protection you need. And I always like to give just a, a simple example. We represent a lot of professional athletes and celebrities. And uh, you know, take one of my NFL football players who signs for $50 million. Well, if he sued for $5 million, he's not going to be happy, but he still has $45 million left. You know, contrast that with uh, the everyday Joe who might have saved up a couple hundred thousand dollars. You know, if that person sued for a million dollars, they're going to be wiped out. So everybody needs asset protection. Uh, I believe that the less you have, the more you need the protection. Now, certainly the uh, professional athlete is not going to do the same plan as uh, the retiree who saved up a few hundred thousand, but nevertheless, they both need it. And the less you have, the more you really need protection. And a lot of people say, well, what if I already have an asset protection plan? Uh, and if you do, I think that's great. Um, you know, uh, I don't meet many people who already have asset protection plans. Uh, with that being said, a lot of people think they have an asset, asset protection plan, but really they just have an estate plan. So I would encourage you, you know, whether you have an asset protection plan, you think you have an asset protection plan, have it reviewed. You know, every year hopefully you go for a uh, physical. Well, you know, I call this a financial physical. And I always think it's good to have your plan reviewed by even someone who didn't do it because you can get a different point of view. So I always think that that's helpful. So a lot of people say, well, why do I need asset protection? You know, there's this cute little cartoon in the upper right-hand corner, and it's two lawyers talking. And one says, I say Sue. The other one says, anyone in particular. And uh, whenever I show this, I always get a couple laughs 
But you know, unfortunately, this isn't funny. You know, just like you guys are smart enough to uh, attend this webinar and you know, educate yourself uh, and gain knowledge and education, you know, the lawyers get together. But instead of getting together once a month like us, they get together once a week or once a day, and they're talking about you know, who are we going to sue next? You know, who's going to be our next victim? Who's going to be our next target? Is it going to be the drug manufacturers, uh, the uh, car uh, dealerships, the financial advisors? You know, who are we going to target next in the massive uh, tort and class action claim? You know, there's over 100 million lawsuits every single year, and that number is only growing. Uh, in today's bad economy, people are losing their jobs. The people who are lucky enough to keep their jobs are making less and less every single day. You know, lawsuits are truly becoming the next biggest business. You can go pretty much to any corner and hire a free attorney on a contingency fee basis. It costs you nothing but 20, 30 minutes of your time, and if you win, a lot of times it's tax-free money. Uh, there's a one in four chance you will be sued in the next 12 months. So one in four people will be sued in the next year. Uh, the average person and business is sued five times over their lifetime. That means if you have an LLC or an S corporation, on average, you're sued five times, and on average, the company sued five times. Now, these are just the average stats. I have clients that you know, are older, and they've never been sued throughout their entire life, and I think that's great. Now, I have clients that are younger, and they might get sued a half a dozen times a month. You know, a lot of this comes into play. You know, what business are you in? How much liability do you have? How many employees do you have? Do you have thousands of employees? So I'm just trying to give you the stats. Uh, there's a 50% chance of divorce, and a lawsuit can cost you tens of thousands of dollars even if you win the case. And what I mean by that is that it's so easy and cheap to sue someone. You know, like I said, you can pretty much hire a free attorney on any corner for a contingency fee basis. Uh, but to defend the case, it costs you tens of thousands of dollars, and that's really a low minimal number. So somebody might sue you, and uh, they might have a frivolous lawsuit, a BS lawsuit, and you might win. But it could take you four, five, six years, and you might have spent six figures trying to defend the case. So even if you win, sometimes you lose. You know, the trick is not making money, it's keeping it. And the challenge that I give to all of my clients is that for every 60 minutes you spend making money, spend 60 seconds thinking about how to protect it. You know, you work your entire life so you can make money, give your family a better life, donate to charity, uh, pass money on to your kids. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be retired, pulling out of your car, driveway in the car, you know, hit somebody and lose everything. Uh, no difference. Maybe you have a rental property. All of a sudden you're retired and, you know, the renter slips and falls. And who does she sue? You. Maybe she throws a party there. Someone gets injured. So, you know, you work so hard for what you have. You really got to take the time, take a deep breath, take a step back, and, and really protect what you have. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, what about liability insurance? You know, isn't liability insurance enough? And I tell all my clients to buy as much insurance as they can. Uh, it's cheap, and it helps them sleep at night. And uh, I really encourage insurance. With that being said, the clients need to understand that about 70% of lawsuits are not covered by insurance. And if you think about it, it makes common sense. You know, the insurance companies are for-profit companies. You know, they're here to make a profit. They're not not-for-profit. In fact, when you drive down the expressway, uh, you know, at least in uh, Florida, all the uh, big buildings on the side of the highway have the insurance company's name on it. They don't get there by paying all the claims. You know, if they can deny a claim, they're going to. Uh, also, your coverage may be inadequate. Maybe you have you know, 100,000, 300,000 coverage on your car. Well, what if you hit someone and you get sued for a million? Well, they might cover, the insurance company might cover the first 100 or 300,000, but who do you think has to come out of pocket for the rest? Uh, your insurance company might go bankrupt. And you know, if I would have said that a long time ago, you would have hung up the phone. Uh, today we have banks and Fortune 500 companies going out of business. You know, who's to say the, the insurance company won't be next? And also, uh, insurance doesn't cover other uninsured financial risks and divorce. And actually, I've got to change this. There's actually a company out there now uh, offering divorce insurance. So uh, pretty comical. Uh, again, insurance alone is not the answer. You need your own asset protection plan to supplement your insurance. You know, I encourage you buy as much insurance as you can, you know, but don't solely rely on it. You need as many layers and firewalls as possible. You want to make it so difficult and expensive, if not impossible, for anybody to come after you that they don't even want to sue you in the first place. You know, I call it uh, the belt and suspenders approach, and that's getting insurance and having an asset protection plan.
So three maxims of asset protection. Number one, protect yourself before you have a problem. And I never understood why people didn't do this. You know, you can't buy car insurance after you get in a car accident. You know, you can't buy life insurance after you pass away. You can't buy health insurance after you get sick. Uh, I don't understand why people think they can do asset protection after they've been sued. So to do asset protection correctly, you really want to be proactive. You want to start with a basic plan and add firewalls as needed. You know, I can't tell you how many times someone will buy one of my books uh, off Amazon or something, and they'll call me and tell me they need a personal international asset protection Swiss hybrid trust to own an entity international asset protection LLC, and, and I've got to spend 30 minutes really just slowing them down. You know, start with a very basic asset protection plan and add firewalls as needed. You know, as your personal and business assets grow, your plan can grow. As your education grows, your plan can grow. As your assets grow, your plan can grow. But start simple, start inexpensive. And most importantly, don't look for one magic bullet or one size fits all. You know, asset protection is not cookie cutter. Uh, it's totally individualized and customized and tailored planning. You know, what works for somebody might not work for the other people. So you really need to make sure that you have an asset protection plan that's tailored to you, not some cookie cutter plan. A lot of mistakes to avoid when you're talking about asset protection planning, and I'll just quickly go over the five biggest mistakes. Number one, hiding your assets. Asset protection is not about hiding. It's not about secrecy. It's about protection. You should be able to tell every single person what you have and where it is. They just shouldn't be able to get to it. You know, I tell every one of my clients, assume at some point you're going to have to disclose what you have. Because if you lose a lawsuit and you get deposed under oath and they ask you what you have, you've got to tell them. You know, also, you never want to title your assets to straws. I can't tell you how many times someone will come to my office and say, oh, Mr. Presser, I'm protected, but don't worry, I gave everything to my best friend or I gave everything to my brother-in-law. I look at them and I say, what actually makes you think that your best friend or brother-in-law has less legal and financial problems than you? Uh, I've seen cases before, and I can't make up these stories, where a uh, client is being sued, they gave everything to their brother-in-law, the brother-in-law gets a divorce, and they lose all their assets. Uh, I've seen other cases where a client is being sued, they gave everything to their best friend, the best friend ends up getting sued and losing their assets. So you don't want to go title all your assets to straws. You know, the key with asset protection is to own nothing, control everything. You also don't want to title all of your assets to your spouse, and we see this the most with our doctor, physician, surgeon clients. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Presser, uh, everything's in my spouse's name. You know, uh, what makes you think that your spouse can't be sued? Nobody gets up in the morning and expects to be sued. Uh, nobody's immune from a lawsuit. Your wife can get in a car accident taking the kids to soccer practice. So you can't just go transferring everything to your spouse. Also, there's a high divorce rate. Uh, you never want to commit a fraudulent transfer. Uh, a fraudulent transfer is when you transfer an asset out of your name for less than fair market value after there's a uh, potential or present lawsuit and the creditor doesn't get paid. So this deals with not being proactive. This is when you try and do asset protection after you've been sued or after you think you're going to be sued, after you've incurred that liability. So you never want to commit any fraudulent transfers. And lastly, of course, you never want to break any laws. You know, our law firm does very comprehensive planning. We do both domestic and international asset protection planning. And there's nothing wrong with doing international asset protection planning. There's nothing wrong with having offshore bank accounts. Uh, there's something very wrong with having them and not reporting them to the Treasury Department, uh, the IRS, et cetera, et cetera. So regardless of if you're doing domestic or international asset protection planning, you've got to make sure that you're doing all the proper reporting requirements, and you've got to make sure that you know, you're doing everything legally and ethically. So, you know, talk about captive insurance company. You know, what is a captive insurance company? You know, really it's a company that provides risk management services for its, comp for its parent company. And I like to, you know, dumb things down to layman's terms. And, you know, really a captive insurance company is really just an insurance company that the client owns. In fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, I think it was Allstate that, uh, you know, started out as a captive insurance company and look who they've grown to. So there's really no difference between a captive insurance company and a regular insurance company. The only difference is that you, the client, own the insurance company. So what's the bad thing about insurance? You know, you pay your premiums, and if you have no claims at the end of the year, well, you've wasted all your money. Well, with a captive insurance company, you own the insurance company. So if you pay the insurance company and there's no claims at the end of the year, you know, it really just becomes a profit center. Everything becomes profit. So you're getting insurance, 
However, you're also getting the profit uh, if uh, there's no claims at the end of the year. And there's also some tax deductions that go along with it that we'll talk about as well. So, you know, who's using captive insurance companies? Doctors, physicians, surgeons, business owners. Uh, I think about 80 or 85% of Fortune 500 companies uh, are using captive insurance companies, uh, and they've been around for a while. You know, I love uh, captive insurance companies because of the asset protection. You know, whatever money you put into your a captive insurance company is essentially money that you've stripped from your business uh, where it may or may not be protected, and you've put into this captive insurance company, you know, where it is protected. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, should you do the captive insurance company domestic or international? And I'll just spend a couple minutes touching on this. You know, you can set up captive insurance companies domestically inside the United States. You can also set up captive insurance companies internationally outside the United States. What that's referring to is where the licensing is. So just because you set up a captive insurance company uh, internationally doesn't mean the money is international. You know, the money uh, very well and most likely per IRS uh, requirements will be inside the United States. However, the license happens to be international. And a lot of times uh, you can uh, set these up cheaper and less expensive if you do them internationally. And again, I just like to uh, you know, touch on, this, on the fact that you can set up captive insurance companies domestic inside the United States or internationally outside the United States. And the important thing to understand is that if you set them up international, uh, it just means that's where the license is. So it doesn't deal with where you're holding the money. Um, you know, there's a lot of different jurisdictions uh, to set these up, and you know, new jurisdictions are popping up all the time. There's the Caymans, there's uh, BVI, uh, Cook Islands just came out with some new statutes. Uh, so new jurisdictions are really popping up all the time, and, and these are just some international jurisdictions. Uh, there's a lot of domestic jurisdictions as well, and, and, and those jurisdictions are popping up all the time. And the reason you see more and more domestic and international uh, jurisdictions popping up for captive insurance is it becomes a revenue source for the either state uh, or the uh, country or jurisdiction. Uh, the important thing to know here when choosing a uh, jurisdiction for your captive insurance company is to choose the one that right fits your needs. Again, there's no cookie cutter work. Uh, what might work for you might not work for someone else. So a good uh, jurisdiction uh, for a captive insurance company for one person uh, more than likely will not work for the other person. So you want to get individualized, customized, tailored planning needs uh, and figure out what's going to be the right jurisdiction you know, for you. So you know, who can benefit from captive insurance companies? You know, closely held businesses, if you uh, are a business owner, uh, doctors, lawyers. Um, you, know, you need to do, uh, be grossing at least a significant amount. Um, I haven't really seen captives done too often for companies that gross uh, less than $2 million. Uh, and certainly the more you gross and net, uh, you know, the better it will be for you. But uh, I kind of give that to clients as a starting point, you know, that uh, you know, it's, if you're not grossing $2 million, you know, the fees involved in setting these up and, and managing them you know, just might not make sense. And you know, the way it works is that uh, captive insurance companies, you know, they insure your business for very real risks and very real liabilities. Um, however, these risks and liabilities you know, might just be risks and liabilities that either are not available on the open market or might be too expensive. So you know, we talked about how one of the advantages of the captive insurance company is you can uh, you know, in, be your own insurance company, own your own insurance company, which means if there's no claims at the end of the year, everything's profit. You know, another advantage of the captive insurance company is the asset protection. You know, you've stripped money from your business and protected it in the captive insurance company. But another great thing about the captive insurance company is you can uh, insure your business for very real risks that either might not be available on the open market or it might be uh, too expensive. You know, for example, reputational harm. You know, uh, you're a doctor in a very small town. You have one bad surgery. Your practice can be over. You know, loss of key referral source, loss of key customer, uh, maybe for a doctor, loss of hospital privileges, uh, laser malfunction. You know, again, uh, every business is going to be different and everyone's going to have different insurance coverages, but they're very real liabilities, but they're very low probabilities. And the way it works is your business uh, writes a check from your business to your captive insurance company for the insurance coverages, you know, for those insurable risks, whatever they may be for your particular business. Now, again, to kind of talk about asset protection, estate planning, tax planning, kind of putting everything together, you know, when your business writes the check to your captive insurance company, uh, that's an expense, just like it would be uh, for any other uh, insurance. 
uh, when the money goes into your captive insurance company under IRS code, I believe it's 831 subsection B, the money actually goes in tax-free. Um, the law allows for up to, and it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed, but up to $1.2 million uh, can go into your captive uh, tax-free each year. So it's nice because you get, you get the tax deduction from your business and the money's going into the captive tax-free. Uh, so that's some tax planning, and you know certainly that's the one benefit of the captive. But why I really like it is, again, uh, from an insurance and self-insurance point of view, uh, you can insure yourself uh, against risks and own your own insurance company. And from an asset protection point of view, you know you've protected you know a large uh, sum of liquid assets, which certainly will add up uh, over the years. So you know, following the formalities for captive insurance, you know, is so important. Uh, you know, it must be operated as a true insurance company. Uh, there must be a lot of different uh, risk distributions. Uh, all those must always be present. Uh, the investment of the initial capital is required, and there's uh, certain standards that you must invest in. You know, uh, all the stuff is regulated by uh, IRS formalities and regulations. So it's always so crucial uh, to follow all these corporate formalities uh, and making sure that uh, you're crossing all the T's and dotting all your I's. Uh, in regards to uh, profits, you know, you could take the money out in a couple different ways. Uh, one way is you could take it out as a loan. You know, uh, let's say uh, you want to buy that million dollar house. Well, instead of going to the bank where you may or may not be approved uh, and get maybe a jumbo loan at 6-7%, well, you could take a loan from your captive insurance company. Um, I call this kind of being your own bank. Now, with this being said, it's got to be a real loan, so you have to have real documentation, and there has to be real interest rates. But you know, maybe instead of paying you know, some uh, regular bank 6 or 7%, maybe you can pay your uh, captive insurance company you know, a long-term AFR rate of maybe 3%. Again, it's a very real loan, real documentation. You're really paying interest rates, but you're paying a smaller interest rate. And think about it. It doesn't really matter what you're paying because you're paying it to your captive insurance company, which means that you're kind of being your own bank. So you know, a loan is always one way to get money out of the captive insurance company. Uh, you can also take the uh, money out uh, as ordinary income. So in that case, you know, you've kind of just deferred the taxes on the money. And uh, if you ever want to uh, liquidate and close up, it's treated, the captive is treated like a C-corp, so you're going to pay capital gains you know, when you sell those C-corp shares. Um, talk, touching a little bit about uh, business succession planning you know, and what business succession planning is uh, and also the benefits of it. You know, uh, asset protection deals with how do you protect what you have while you're alive? How do you make sure that nobody can take you know, what you worked your whole life so hard to obtain? You know, that's what asset protection deals with. You know, estate planning deals with, okay, when you die, where do you want your assets to go? How do you get them there quickly? How do you get them there privately? So asset protection deals with how do you protect what you have while you're alive? Uh, estate planning deals with how, where do you, uh, how do you get your assets or where you want them to go when you pass away quickly, privately, and with the least amount of taxes that's legally and ethically possible. Business succession planning is really just estate planning for your business. You know, what happens when you pass away? What will happen to your business? Will it vanish and just close up, or do you have some sort of business succession plan? You know, do you have partners? If so, hopefully you've done some business succession planning where you've talked about buyouts from the family because the last thing you want to do is be negotiating with your partner's wife once he passes away. Uh, and the benefits are is that you know, you're going to know exactly what's going to happen with your business. You know, what's going to happen to your share? What's going to happen to your partner's share? And you're really going to ensure that your business lives on. So you know, I look at business succession planning as really just no more than estate planning for a business. And I can't tell you, you know, we have clients that are just starting out in business. Uh, we have billionaires with a B, and we have everything in between. And I can't tell you, you know, large and small, uh, not too many people have done business succession planning. So it's always something uh, to consider. Um, also, estate planning. You know, estate planning, like we talked about, deals with you know uh, where do you want your assets to go when you pass away? How do you get them there quickly, privately? But even more important is you need to coordinate your estate planning with your asset protection planning. I always tell my clients you have to appoint what I call a financial quarterback. You know, your estate planning attorney should be speaking to your asset protection attorney. Your asset protection attorney should be speaking to your financial advisor. Your financial advisor should be speaking to your CPA. You know, everybody's got to be on the same page. And it's so important that your estate planning fits hand in hand with your asset protection planning. So you want to make sure that while you're alive, everything is protected. But when you 
pass away, everything goes where you want it to go. So just make sure that your estate planning and asset protection planning go hand in hand. And I always tell my clients, you know, uh, have your asset protection plan, have your estate plan reviewed in a couple different scenarios. You know, uh, once a year, once every few years, uh, if you've changed assets, maybe you've bought or sold a, a bunch of different assets, Maybe you're making a lot more or a lot less money, but you know as lifestyle changes change, uh, definitely have your asset protection and estate planning checked out, or do so on a yearly basis. I, I just call it a uh, financial physical. Um, and I'd encourage you to stay with us. Um, we have some upcoming webinars uh, going on that we'll tell you about. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes or so, um, and I'm going to put up a poll. And I'd really uh, appreciate it you know, if you can answer just the quick question that I put up there on the poll. Um, I've received a bunch of questions I know uh, throughout the webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'll take the next five minutes while you're um, answering the poll to uh, put these questions together. And then I'll return in about five minutes and uh, answer all of your questions. Uh, again, I'd really encourage you to stay on because I think you'll get a lot out of it. People always have great questions. And again, as I mentioned before, um, any questions, uh, feel free to email us, uh, info at assetprotectionattorneys.com. Um, you know, if, uh, today was just meant to be a very general overview. If, if you have more specific questions, happy to do a, a complimentary preliminary consultation with anybody. Uh, just contact our office. And again, if you're a member of any group or organization and you, know, you found today's uh, brief uh, webinar uh, helpful and educational, you know, we do present nationwide uh, normally from about 30 minutes to 3 hours. So I'll be back with you in about 5 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, post um, uh, a poll for you, and I'm going to gather the questions, and I'll be back in a few minutes uh, to answer everything. I appreciate it, and talk soon.